The Mauler, G.I. Joe's manned battle tank. Does the form follow the function? G.I. Joe is filled with an amazing assortment of vehicles. Each Joe vehicle has its own distinct look, some more realistic than others. By that I mean the degree to which a Joe design is based on real world or experimental military vehicles. In this video, I'm going to explore the possible origins of the Mauler's visual styling. The Mauler definitely feels like one of the more realistic Joe vehicles, so we should be able to determine what influenced the designers and then see how the inspiration stacks up against the reference. And does the form follow the function? So what do we know about the Mauler from reading the box and other Hasbro printed material? The box names the vehicle the Mauler MBT tank, manned battle tank. But manned battle tank? MBT usually stands for main battle tank and represents the most powerful tank fielded by a nation's army. Why not main for the Mauler? Maybe the Mauler is not meant to be the biggest and most powerful tank in the G.I. Joe arsenal? And what do they mean by manned? Are they implying that there are unmanned tanks? This is kind of strange, but also interesting. We also know that the Mauler was first released in 1985 and was finally discontinued in 1987. This is the mid-80s. The Cold War is in full effect. The M1 Abrams is the new MBT for the US with Russia fielding its T-80 tank, both massive heavy tanks. Not calling the Mauler a main battle tank seems to have been intentional, possibly to avoid placing it in the same class as the biggest heaviest tanks of the day. And we need to remember that the Mobat, G.I. Joe's first tank, is sometimes referred to as the Joe's main battle tank. If not a heavy main battle tank, then what kind of tank is the Mauler? Let's start by looking at the published stats and try to sort this out. The Order of Battle in 1986 says the Mauler weighed 58 tons, had a road speed of 65 miles an hour, and a 105 millimeter M68 gun with 75 rounds of high explosive warheads. It also had an Avco Lycoming AGT 1500E turbine engine. The Action Card in 1986 says the Mauler was a two-man tank that could go 62 miles per hour had a 12-cylinder supercharged diesel with 1,800 horsepower and an MXZ earthquake cannon. Whereas rank and file in 1991 said that the MBT was a mobile battle tank. Mobile, not manned. It was a three-man tank, could go 65 mile an hour, and again had the Avco Lycoming AGT-1500, a 105mm gun with 75 rounds of high-explosive warheads. It also mentions lightweight titanium armor on the exterior. The Mauler MBT blueprints say that it could go 62 miles per hour, had a 12-cylinder twin supercharged diesel engine, the MXZ earthquake cannon, and that it weighed 57 tons and was using nylon micro mesh titanium alloy 60 layer hull armor. What can we gather from this information? There's definitely some inconsistency, but why? I would guess that this is probably a result of the projects being handed off from one person to the next from year to year. For our purposes, let's go with what seems to be the most consistent and legitimate. The stats that seem like the one-offs we'll just ignore. First, let's look at the crew. The Mauler having a crew of two to three tells us a lot. According to Miller and Foss's Modern Land Combat, during World War II, the majority of MBTs were crewed by five men. The commander, gunner, loader, driver, and bow machine gunner. Modern MBTs have done away with the bow gunner, reducing the total crew to four. A crew of less than four can only be achieved with the introduction of an auto loader, replacing the loader crew member. This is a very important design decision, and will come up later as we look at main guns. It also suggests that the Mauler could have a very low profile, as often it is the loader's standing height that dictates the overall height of the turret and therefore the tank. We should also note that the only named crew member is Heavy Metal, and he's named as the driver. This would leave the position of gunner and commander open to any other Joe member. But it should also be noted that the Mauler can only accommodate two figures. Is having only a crew of two possible for a modern tank? As we will discover, it actually is possible. Now let's look at the weight. 58 tons, 57 tons, that sounds like a main battle tank. The early Abrams is 60 tons, and the Russian T-80 is around 40 tons. If these numbers are correct, then the Mauler is definitely in the weight class of a main battle tank. Engine and power plant. So we have two sources saying diesel, and two sources saying gas turbine. In the 80s, both the T-80 and the Abrams were outfitted with gas turbine engines, similar to the engine you'd find in a helicopter. 
The turbine creates a tremendous amount of horsepower for its weight, but at a cost of lower fuel efficiency and the generation of much more heat than a comparable diesel. Not good for hiding from infrared sensors. Germany and Britain, on the other hand, both take a different tact by choosing diesels for their tanks. Major reasons being diesel's proven reliability, ease of support in the field, and better range because of the fuel efficiency. For now, we really can't make a call on the type of engine the Mahler has, but once we better determine the Mahler's role in the Joe's arsenal, we'll be able to make a more informed decision. Top speed, 65, 62 miles per hour. These are pretty high speeds for any tank, and we should note that this is road speed. But again, compared to an Abrams with a top speed of 45 miles an hour and a T80 with a top speed of 43 miles per hour, the Mahler is a race car. This raises the question of how the Mahler is this fast with the above power plants and yet is on the same or heavier side of the MBT weight class. Main gun. 105 millimeter is the only real world size given in any of the literature we have access to. And we don't really know what an MXZ earthquake cannon is. But for the mid 80s, 105 mm is a bit undersized for an MBT. Most modern tanks consider 120 mm to be the minimum, with the T80 sporting a 130 mm main gun. We should note that the Mobat sports a 130 mm cannon. So why 105 mm for the Mahler? As we'll later see, it could be that the Earthquake cannon is a different type of gun from the standard main tank cannon. It might also be a result of the Mahler actually being a lighter weight tank. Lastly, let's look at armor. Titanium and micro mesh nylon? This sounds experimental, unlike the standard steel plate or aluminum in most tanks. Chobram or composite armor made of layers of varying materials might be what the micro mesh titanium mix is describing. The 80s saw many breakthroughs like this in tank armor. Less conventional reactive type armor like that outfitted on some T80s is not mentioned, so we'll assume this isn't present on the Mahler. Also, there were no active defense systems back in the 80s, so we can rule those out as well. Now that we've gone over the stats, let's look at the visual cues we see in the Mahler's design. So what are some of the visual influences we can identify for the Mahler? The most obvious is the high survivability test vehicle. There's a fantastic cover piece on the May 1988 issue of Popular Mechanics illustrating the HSTV, but that magazine was published some years too late to have really influenced the Mahler's design. But that doesn't mean the HSTV wasn't an influence. The Hasbro team was probably looking at photos or other materials depicting the HSTV. And as you can see in these photos, the US military built a real world Mauler. The HSTV and the Mauler look almost identical. How cool is that? G.I. Joe is fielding a real world experimental tank. Now let's look at how the visuals match up with the stats and the toy itself. Does this all come together neatly? If we look at the size, the scale isn't too far off, but the Mahler looks a bit larger and beefier than the tank that it takes its visual cues from. Also, the visual ref is of a light tank. So then, is that what the Mahler is supposed to be? A light tank? The stats put it way over the weight limit of a light tank. Or is it really just a heavy MBT that Hasbro made look like a light experimental tank, simply for aesthetic reasons? The latter is probably the case, but let's keep looking. Maybe we can create a narrative that will reconcile some of these contradictions that we're seeing. But before we go too far down that road, we should better understand why tank designers are making the decisions they are. Why can't the Mahler just be light with a big fast engine and the biggest cannon the US military can buy? We have to take into account the three factors in tank design, defense, which is armor, offense, your gun, and mobility, which is the power to the weight ratio of the tank. To be a light tank, the first thing you have to shed is armor. This means maybe using aluminum instead of steel or titanium. And we do see this mentioned in the Mahler stats. Another way to shed weight is with a composite of several different types of armor, such as the micro mesh stat, which is also mentioned. But no matter what the designer does, lighter armor does mean less protection. And this is where mobility can really come into play. The theory being that if they can hit you, it doesn't matter that your tank has less armor. The strategy being that a tank that can shoot and scoot will be gone before it can get targeted. In support of this notion, we see main battle tank level horsepower from the Mauler, suggesting a great power to weight ratio, and therefore higher top speeds. And finally we come to offense, the weapons package, in this case the main gun. So why doesn't the Mauler sport a larger gun? 
A larger gun creates a tremendous recoil force in the range of 37 tons, too much for an HSTV size vehicle to handle. If the Mauler was truly meant to be in the 60 ton range, it could handle a larger gun, but this is never suggested. Since we know the Mauler is based on the look of the high survivability test vehicle, we should learn where that design came from. This will help us understand why the HSTV looks the way it does and the role it was designed to fill. And this role may be in line with that of the Mauler's role in the G.I. Joe team. The HSTV is a light tank, so let's look at the origin of the light tank. And why would anyone even want to have a light tank? We can start back during World War II when the tank and airplane really came into their own. Tanks were getting heavier and aircraft were taking on new roles. One of those roles was transporting troops behind enemy lines. It was soon discovered that these troops needed more firepower, so the military was desperate to find motorized guns or small tanks that could be transported by air. This desire to have a fighting force that can be airlifted to any place in the world is a concept that has and still does drive many military doctrines. By the 50s and 60s in the Vietnam era, the U.S. had a purpose-built light tank called the Sheridan. It was built around a large caliber gun-missile-cannon combination. This was derived from the M60A2 Starship, which was based on a main battle tank called the M60. This light tank was meant to support troops and could be transported to any place soldiers could go. To give it some real punch, the gun, as mentioned, could shoot missiles as well as standard rounds. The rounds were low velocity and so didn't create a big recoil, important for a light tank like the Sheridan. As mentioned earlier, too big of a recoil and it could rip itself apart. To keep the weight down, the tank was fitted with aluminum armor, leaving it somewhat lightly protected. Unfortunately, while the Sheridan broke ground by being able to be transported in a C-130 airplane and air dropped or even low altitude dropped, it never really hit its stride. The innovative weapon system was plagued with issues, rendering it unreliable. But this did not discourage the military from pursuing the dream of a powerful air transportable tank. The next phase in light tank development was shaped by the ever-changing military needs of the time. In his paper, Rapid Deployment Forces, David Eisenberg sums up the military strategy as it stood during the late 70s and early 80s. Following the fourfold OPEC price increases of 1973 and 74, people began to think of the military force as a means of maintaining access to Persian Gulf oil. These events renewed interest in the easily transported tank and spawned many new experimental programs. The program we're interested in was the Armored Combat Vehicle Technology Analysis Program. This joint initiative between the Army and Marines focused on the reduction of the size of the tank while maintaining its firepower. The plan was to create a lightweight and easily transportable tank to replace the Sheridan. In 1978, this morphed into the Advanced Anti-Armor Vehicle Evaluation Program. The first test vehicle to be created was the ELK, Elevated Kinetic Energy Vehicle, and we all think G.I. Joe had some crazy acronyms. This prototype utilized the chassis of the aforementioned Sheridan tank outfitted with an overhead gun pod. The gun could rest flat on the chassis and then be raised up to shoot. This allowed the tank to remain hidden behind terrain while still engaging enemy targets. This was made possible because of a new weapon system, the Ares 75mm smoothbore cannon. The Ares cannon is fed with an automatic magazine holding 60 rounds of APFSDS, armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo ammunition, and multi-purpose ammunition, and when used for indirect fire, has a maximum range of 12,000 meters. That's really far. The gun could also achieve an incredible muzzle velocity of 1,500 meters per second, giving the 75mm round penetration equal to that of a 105mm round. How is this possible? The Ares mitigated the recoil with a muzzle brake, redirecting barrel gas backwards to counteract the forward forces of the firing gun. It also incorporated a longer recoil stroke. This means the breech, which is the rear section of the gun, moves farther after each shot, so it then has a longer time to slow down and doesn't have to brake as hard. These innovations reduce the recoil force from the 35 ton range down to only 9 tons much more tolerable for a light chassis tank. And look at that gun. Looks very familiar, doesn't it? The next step was the HIMAG, or High Mobility Agility Test Vehicle. To reduce weight, it did away with a conventional three-man turret. Instead, it used a unique gun mount, allowing the Ares cannon to reach past 40 degrees elevation for anti-air defense. 
The fire control system had infrared sights, and a gun-laying radar was tested. It used a conventional tank hull, which was fitted with a new hydropneumatic suspension. The next experiment was the RDF-LT. This was a 13.4-ton vehicle, and it was claimed eight could be carried in a C5 Galaxy, two in a C141, and one in a C130, the air-transportable aircraft we talked about before. The CH-47 and CH-53 helicopters could also carry the RDF-LT as an underslung load. And once again, this tank carries the Ares 75mm gun, this time in several different configurations. The final evolution, and the one we're most interested in, is the high survivability test vehicle. It is the proto-tank that most resembles the Mauler. The HSTV is not a variable parameter test bed like the previous tanks, but a true test of the three-man crew and the hunter-killer fire control concept. In this configuration, the commander uses a stabilized hunter sight that revolves independently of the turret. Once a target is selected in his sight, the turret and killer sight can be aligned with it. The gunner can then destroy the selected target while the commander returns to searching for more targets with his hunter sight. Unfortunately, all of these tanks were based on the 75mm Ares gun, and when the army decided that the Ares didn't pack enough punch to deal with the Soviet armor, the program stalled, and the army and marines went their separate ways. Post-Cold War and current day, we see that light tanks are losing favor to cheaper, faster alternatives, while at the same time, IFVs, or infantry fighting vehicles, are also growing in popularity, both wheeled and tracked such as the Stryker, the Sabra, and the CV-90, which can all be fitted with 105mm cannons. Budget-conscious generals like the idea of being able to carry troops and a big gun within a single, inexpensive vehicle. But there is still hope for the light tank. As of 2020, the Army is running the Mobile Protected Firepower Program. This is a fast-tracked competition to find a light tank capable of neutralizing bunkers, urban defensive positions, and armored vehicles. The tank must be airdroppable from a C-17 or C-130 with sufficient maneuverability to operate in urban, forest, jungle, and mountainous terrain. Currently BAE and General Dynamics are submitting vehicles for testing. Both take advantage of customizable applique armor systems and a light recoil main gun with autoloader. Sounds familiar, right? 40 years later and the Army is still looking for a replacement to the Sheridan. Why don't they just build some Maulers? Interestingly enough, the BAE design is actually based around the M8 Buford, a successor to the HSTV from the Armored Gun System program of the late 1990s. So now that we've studied the development of the experimental light tanks that the Mahler was based on, does this align with the Mahler's capabilities and performance? We already looked at the statistics, but how effective was the Mahler in the field, and how did the Joes use it? G.I. Joe's purpose was to defend human freedom against COBRA, a ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world. This required Joes to fight in any area of the world where COBRA might pose a threat. A light, air-transportable tank would be a welcome addition and a necessity to such a team. Let's look at the Mauler's combat record and see what types of enemy weapons the Mauler has faced and how it fared. In issue 44 of the G.I. Joe comic, we see the Mauler demonstrate its speed and agility while keeping pace with the awe striker. The Mauler then keeps ahead of a his tank while weaving through a maze of debris. Then in issue 50, we see the hitting power of the Mauler when it easily takes out some his tanks at the Springfield airport. Later in issue 51, we see the Mauler's weaknesses when it is nearly destroyed by the Dregnock Thunder Machine in a frontal attack. This is conclusive evidence that the Mauler is lightly armored for a tank. The Thunder Machine is equipped with two 20mm Gatling guns. That caliber of weapon could never penetrate the armor of a heavy main battle tank. The damage the Mauler receives in this one attack is so severe that in the next issue we see the Mauler brought back on a flatbed, not even able to move under its own power. Another clue about the Mauler's weight comes to us in issue 76, where we can see the Mauler performing an amphibious assault on Cobra Island with other vehicles loaded into the transport with it. While a heavy tank, like say the Abrams, can be transported on similar LCM-8 type ships, it needs to be transported alone because of its great weight. And finally, in issue 108, 
we see the Mauler's firepower again as it repeatedly damages a terror drone with attacks from its main gun. Unfortunately, the tank is eventually knocked out by Cobra forces. If we now look to the G.I. Joe cartoon, in the Traitor Part 1, we can see the Mauler using its gun to take out aircraft, something we saw in the High Mag experimental tank. The Mauler then shrugs off a missile attack from a Rattler, but it is revealed that this is due to a special armor chemical that has been added to the tank. Later in the episode, Lady J then knocks out a stolen Mauler and flips it using some air-to-ground missiles fired from the Dragonfly. Then, in A Rise Serpenter Part 3, we see the Mauler help push back Cobra's attack in a giant full-on battle. And in Pyramid of Darkness, we see the Mauler once again demonstrate its mobility as it battles up a snow-covered mountain alongside specialized Arctic combat vehicles. A very impressive feat for a tank. Having seen the Mauler in action, what are the other vehicles G.I. Joe is fielding next to it? There is the Lynx, which appears to carry the same main gun as the Mauler, though the blueprints label it as a 203mm high-velocity laser-guided pressurized cannon. 203mm, that's bigger than the Slugger's cannon. We're going to disregard that description because of how unrealistic it is. Anyway, the Lynx is a smaller and presumably lighter chassis than the Mauler. From this we can infer that the Lynx fills the role of the team's light tank, along with the Armadillo and Persuader, both of which we see being airlifted in the comics by a C-130. Remember, the C-130 is the military's baseline for air transportability. There's even a description of the Persuader being the intermediate between the Mauler and the Havoc. Here we know that the Havoc weighs in at 54 tons and is on the heavier range of vehicles. This again reinforces the idea the Mauler isn't a heavy vehicle like the Mobat or the Havoc, but is meant to sit in the middle as a well-armored and well-armed tank with a focus on mobility. Now that we've done all this research, we're ready to take all that we've learned and pick a final set of stats to determine the Mauler's mission designation. I'm going to read this off as if this is what should have been on the blueprints that came with the Mauler. Crew. The Mauler sports a crew of two. With its advanced hunter-killer targeting system and auto-loading cannon, the Mauler only needs a driver and a gunner commander. The gunner can mark and track targets, allowing heavy metal to focus on driving. Weight. 40 tons. This was the toughest call to make. All the stats show the Mauler weighing in at 60-ish tons, but the proof is in the action reports. This tank is fast and agile, but it can't handle sustained fire like a heavier, more thickly armored tank. As a result, the Mauler is on the lighter side for a battle tank. Engine. The Avco Lycoming AGT 1500E turbine, the same power plant used in the United States' Abrams MBT. This engine isn't the most fuel efficient, but it puts out a heck of a lot of power, especially when placed in a 40-ton tank like the Mauler. Main gun. The Mauler's cannon is similar to the Ares 75, but G.I. Joe went with a larger caliber experimental 105mm cannon with an unprecedented muzzle velocity, low recoil, and auto-loading functionality. Armor. The Mauler uses a super secret titanium and microweave ceramic composite. This can be enhanced with applique add-on armor to give the Mauler even more protection, but at the cost of mobility. And there you have it, the definitive Mauler stats, according to me. So, does the form follow the function? It sure does. With its medium-sized chassis, the Mauler allows G.I. Joe to take the fight to Cobra all over the globe in ever-changing theaters of battle. The low-profile silhouette and small turret make the Mauler a hard target to hit. Combine that with an insane power-to-weight ratio and powerful main weapon, and this innovative tank sports both firepower and mobility to give G.I. Joe the edge in every fight. Boy, was that a lot of information. The more I researched on the subject, the more I found. I was originally going to just add this to the end of my Mauler repair video, but the subject just grew and grew. It almost felt like watching the end of The Lord of the Rings, where there's 40 minutes left and you're like, wait, shouldn't this be over? But I love this kind of stuff so much, I just had to run with it and see where it took me. I hope you enjoyed going through this exercise with me and found it interesting. Do you agree with the final stats I came up with? Does the form follow the function? Do you have a favorite real-world tank that you'd like to see G.I. Joe base one of their vehicles on? Maybe a future design? If so, leave a comment below, and thanks for watching.